This is William Afton. This is also William Afton. This represents William Afton. This is a virus mimicking William Afton. And this is William Afton in a different universe. But no matter what continuity you are in, no matter what timeline you decide to create, William Afton is always at the centre of it. And that's why today I want to spend some time with you going through the history and evolution of the purple guy. Every depiction of him and the aura of agony around him, and every twisted face he has ever embodied. And if you stick around until the end of the video, I'll reveal what I believe is the scariest face of them all. This video is sponsored by G Fuel. G Fuel is the market leader in the energy drink industry and that's no surprise because they're all about performance. G Fuel gives you game changing energy and laser focus and yet it is completely sugar free. So if you're a gamer like my guy Toy Freddy, it's basically a cheat code. In fact, I used G Fuel whilst editing this very video and it gave me the endurance needed to get most of it done in just one night. My favourite flavour is Hype Sauce, which is a delicious blend of raspberry lemonade. But there are over 50 different flavours to try from, and you can start right now by going to gfuel.com and using the code OZONEYT for 20% off on all products. Thank you so much to G Fuel for sponsoring this video. November 11th, 2014. Scott Cawthon's indie game Five Nights at Freddy's was already a huge hit and the highly anticipated sequel had just landed. Kids in schools around the world were talking about having nightmares of the puppet, getting terrified rare screens with shadowy animatronics, and being killed by Golden Freddy himself. But they also witnessed what was arguably the scariest thing in the game at that time. Dead kids everywhere. People realised that behind those innocent looking Atari style death minigames were some dark secrets that chilled you to the core. And very clearly behind it all, a purple figure with a huge psychopathic grin on his face. This was a character we saw multiple times in these minigames and was dubbed the purple guy by the community. It was like an urban legend, people discussed sightings of him all the time, people tried to spread hoaxes about him, and he was quickly identified as a major character in the series. I think that part of the reason why he was such a mystery and a huge character at the time is because he didn't actually have a name. When you learn more about a person, it leaves less room for filling in the blanks. When you learn names, motives and tendencies, they can become familiar and relatable as a person, and hence a lot less scary. Whereas the purple guy, a name that continued and stuck for the first four games, really felt like a character, a monster that was hidden in the shadows, the fear of the unknown. And I could spend a long time talking about every purple guy appearance and why it was effective, but there's one that absolutely stays my favourite to this very day. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 ends with the purple guy panicking and flailing about before jumping into the yellow rabbit suit and getting springlocked to death. And that was the end of the purple guy. But something that Scott does amazingly in this game is he shows us the story back to front. He presents us with a horrifying looking animatronic for the entirety of the game, only for us to finally understand who he is right at the end. We learn that purple guy's story has only just begun because now he takes the form of Springtrap. I don't care what you think of FNAF 3 as a whole, but you have got to agree that Springtrap's design is difficult to floor. For me, some of the scariest images in the series have got to be some of the teaser images for Springtrap. This image, for example, is beautifully artistic, with a spotlight shining down on the old animatronic shells. But brighten it, and you see the other presence that is looming in the darkness, just like the purple guy himself. And the coolest part of this was nobody knew this was Purple Guy at the time. Nobody knew the deep story and conflicts behind this one character. Nobody knew at the time why he was standing there, staring into our souls from the darkness. And still, all these years later, Springtrap is one of the community's favourite characters. He is the personification of evil, and he represented the twisted psychopathy of the Purple Guy. He encapsulates the dread and fear that shadowed over the legend of the Purple Guy, and he is the first iteration of William's curse that would continue for years to come. 
The scariest part about him is that in FNAF 3, he is your only real threat. That makes him appear special, different, more powerful and terrifying. The following books and games finally brought light to his name and more of his evil doings, and it also brought us the evolution of Springtrap. Scrap Trap. And the reason I think a lot of people don't connect with Scrap Trap as much is because he isn't as special. His design can be criticized as being goofy, and in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, Scrap Trap isn't your only threat. In fact, he's only just as threatening as the other attacking animatronics, and as a result, he gets overshadowed. But sometimes, I believe characters can positively evolve in very indirect ways. For example, Sister Location may not put a new face to William Afton itself. But the environment, themes and story can all be connected to him and his character. Likewise, Afton is represented by a heartless purple-wearing vampire. Similarly, in this image of Lefty's death screen, the whole family of Aftons is represented by this poster, with William the Ventriloquist being a manipulator of others and ultimately having control over everything. I made a whole video on this concept a while back, and while it is a little outdated due to the introduction of the Mimic, it's still a great watch. The early days of William Afton's character was impeccable. His character was developed by each game and it didn't go too far. There was still mystery and it's still all tied back to the legend of the purple guy. William Afton was very clearly portrayed as the core of the series, with the catchphrase, I always come back. And unsurprisingly, he did come back, just not in the way we were all expecting. The Five Nights at Freddy's lore definitely got a lot more funky after Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator and Ultimate Custom Night. But whether you believe Glitchtrap is a digital manifestation of Afton's agony or a spreading, mimicking virus taking control, he still takes the form and appearance of William Afton. And to be honest, Glitchtrap is one of my favourites. He feels more human-like, which is a huge contrast to all of the other animatronics. But obviously, he isn't human at all. There could be anything inside that suit, and of course, it is just a digital copy. But all of that is part of what makes Glitchtrap so eerie, the strangely smooth motion and constant smile. Sometimes the scariest monsters are the ones that are able to mimic human behaviour. The point is, the franchise had quite a big transition at this point, with the games being led by Steel Wool Studios and being much more than the standard point and click. And with this, the focus of the story changed. It's less about William Afton himself and stopping the murderer in his tracks, it's more about his legacy and the impact that he and the agony that he inspired has on the world and the continuation of Fazbear Entertainment as a business. And all of it starts with this digital manifestation of him. It's an avatar that recreates him down to the suit's stitches. And in Five Nights at Freddy's VR Help Wanted, we actually get to witness the cruel acts of the past, and it is horrifying. One of my absolute favourite appearances of Glitchtrap was actually in the teaser videos leading up to Security Breach, Freddy and Friends on tour. Hey, Freddy and Friends on tour was a fake TV show that was uploaded to the Steel Wolf Studios channel, starting on the 8th of September 2021. There were four episodes in total with each one uploaded every other week, and it acted as a series of teasers for Security Breach before its release. Each episode had secret glitched frames showing characters, an ending teaser that would show an animation of another character, and it would give another digit to the release date. Additionally, there were strange codes in the glitches that we eventually discovered was a cipher for solving the wall code in the sister location room. And while the first three episodes were structured exactly the same, the fourth episode was the most glitchy and finally showed a truce between the four characters. This time, hidden within the glitches, was something a lot more menacing. Oh, it is really glitchy. Oh boy. It's like purple and yellow. Oh my gosh. It is broken! It's Just so like bad. Wow. Do you think there's something in yeah. the, the videos, like, trying to tell us something? I wonder, so, yeah, I wonder if, like, there's a cypher and all these things. Inky, how do you go like, frame by frame again? Let's try and pause on it. Oh, it's fast. It's still one frame. Even yeah, it's one down. frame. Oh my god! You what, good? what's up? And what's I think up? I know what you're thinking of. 
I think I've seen it. Oh my god! Oh, so what? Okay, what is wait. it? Okay, 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 okay. I, I'm going to share this photo with you. I know um, what you're thinking. So, right, okay. So basically, you know how we have the Vanessa glitch? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so we have that glitch, and that's very clear. And then we have all of these other random purple glitches, and everyone thought it was purple guy last time, right? Oh, I mean, if you let me send you this, let me let me let me exactly let me show you this photo. Oh no! Wait. This is like the most jam packed. And I'm glad we could all be. Oh, that is cool. It's glitch trap. Wait, and this is every episode. That's absolute. That's absolute. No, no, no! It's it's this episode. It's all in this episode, and. I don't see it. It's a puzzle. It's all it's all in this episode and it's the yellow bits. I said those purple and yellow. Oh my god. That's right. There were 20 frames in the last episode that had purple and yellow glitches. If you put the pieces back together, the iconic line from the series that also relates to Glitchtrap and Help Wanted, you get this image of Glitchtrap, which might have to be one of the coolest easter eggs this series has ever seen. As I said, it's menacing and it has a lot more meaning. The descriptions for these videos say that these are episodes of the show that were found buried in the Fazbear Entertainment archives for our enjoyment. And it clearly shows that this virus is corrupting everything and watching over. And while I think a lot of people don't like the recent lore that has come out of the series, I really like how the main antagonists feel more like a force of nature than anything. You can destroy Afton and you can incinerate his remnant all that you want, but none of that is going to stop the force of Afton's legacy. I don't want to get too into theories today, but I'd say the consensus right now is that Glitchtrap is at least somewhat related to the Mimic program that was first introduced in the Tales from the Pizzaplex books. After all, Glitchtrap is able to mimic the voice of Parker in Prankster and Tape Girl in Help Wanted. <laughs> But if you take a step back from the law and just think about the concept here, it's very creepy. We have an uncontrollable entity that is able to replicate human behavior and it's spreading and duplicating itself. It's forming shapes that make sense, and it's intelligent enough to have fooled us as a community for the better part of four years. The possibilities from that point are endless, and it's terrifying to think all of this supposedly came from a computer program that did some research on a killer from the past. This of course led to the Mimic, potentially Burn Trap, ending up in his nest beneath the Pizzaplex, while I did a video a while ago about how Afton became oversaturated as a villain after Burn Trap, I do think his bare skeletal look and slow movement is actually quite chilling. Due to the structure of Security Breach and the gameplay, he doesn't feel all too menacing. But I did say in that old video that Burn Trap relies solely on Afton's reputation, and as a blank slate, adds nothing to Afton's character. But due to a perspective change thanks to the books, it's less of a downgrade from Afton's character, and more of an upgrade to the Mimics. It's terrifying knowing that it's possible each layer of this robot has its own story behind it. A burnt, metallic endoskeleton with a crushed skull and organics from its own victims. It's actually more tragic than we all first thought. And to think that all of it came from inspiration. While the game's universe is where the main timeline takes place, I'd actually argue that the story of William Afton that the games tell is a lot less scary than the Afton in the other pieces of media. October 27th, 2023 was a huge date for FNAF fans, including myself. I went to see the FNAF movie in the theatre for the first time and I had one of the best evenings I've had in a while. I think I speak for a lot of the fans right there because it was so surreal to see characters on the big screen which I've grown alongside. The animatronics were super cute but could be super dark if they needed to be. The family dynamic was disheartening but inspiring and the story was relatively good, at least. 
Of course, there are places where we can criticize the movie, but as of the 27th of December 2023, it has completed its theatrical run in the United States and grossed over $295.1 million. With a $20 million budget, it's safe to say that the movie was a huge success. So big that it has become Blumhouse's highest grossing movie ever. And while critics didn't seem to think highly of it, the fans absolutely loved it. The main character of the movie is Mike Schmidt, but I think I could form an argument that most of the limelight is actually on the main villain of the story, William Afton, previously under the alias of Steve Raglan. This man carries a huge weight of the movie's reception. Not only a villain, but a twist villain, Matthew Lillard did a tremendous job at playing this character, but it's such a shame that he doesn't get as much screen time as he deserves. Starting with Steve Raglan, this character is very comedic, but the way Lillard plays him makes him seem strangely unstable, crooked, sociopathic. The characterization of William Afton in this whole first scene is subtle, but beautifully performed. In fact, this is exactly how I imagined Afton to act under a fake name and job title. What you get are hints towards something more sinister, something that the average viewer can definitely miss. And then when you rewatch it, it all seems to fall into place. Maybe he stared at Mike just a little too long right there. Maybe he has turned away from Mike to show a disconnect and that he may not be as he seems. There's a million tiny clues in the performance alone that allows you to see through the twisted reality of the situation. And then you ask his motives, his story, how he got to this position and his whole history, the thing that made him snap, the situation with his daughter. All of it sums into who he is today and what he has become with that devilish smirk. And the image that sums up William Afton as a character for me from this movie is the image of him as the yellow rabbit alongside his daughter, Vanessa, with Garrett's toy plane. When this image came on screen, I think I audibly gasped, and I bet all your jaws dropped too. It was so bittersweet. The moment of realization happened for everybody here as a shared experience, and the addition of the plane in the photo sent shivers. It's arguably the most twisted part of the entire movie and even tops a lot of things that happen in the games. I think part of the reason for that is because in the games, characters aren't really the main focus. Sure, it's upsetting that these kids all went missing, but it's never really about their story. They're just side characters in a huge ponderous world of haunted animatronics, nothing more than just reasons and answers to questions, and hence nobody really cares about the grief and repercussions that this had on the lives of their families. However, with the books and the movie, you start to develop more of an emotional understanding and therefore you can empathize. You're taught to care about these characters so when something awful happens to them, it shatters your heart. In this picture, we know Vanessa and we trust her. We've seen Garrett's plane and we know what that represents. We sympathize with Mike. And then we see the thing that connects the two, the yellow rabbit. Much like the name, the purple guy, which we talked about before, the Yellow Rabbit is a name that should have innocence behind it, but is overshadowed by darkness and ill intent. That's why I actually do feel like this part of the movie is a little goofy to me. Maybe it's just because I'm a fan and I recognize the name, but when Vanessa says William Afton, I feel it somewhat destructs a lot of the character that was built up to that point. It doesn't take away that much though, because the children just know him as the Yellow Rabbit and their eventual vengeance against him makes it all worthwhile. If there is any scene from this whole movie that is just really clippable and replayable, it's the sequence in which Afton's ego is destroyed. He slowly goes from a grand position of power, knocking over Mike and stabbing Vanessa, into a weak man trying to take back the lead. And this is all shown figuratively by the animatronics themselves, all of them crowding around while the camera slowly orbits Afton in the spotlight. Everything here invites you to look directly at William Afton as his power deteriorates and the agony ensues. The acting with the body language here is phenomenal and the entire thing is terrifying. He's so cursed and twisted that he laughs at his failure. And the reason that's scary is because he knows for sure that he's coming back. And we know that the main characters don't know that. That's dramatic irony. His twitching is similar to that of the Springtrap scene in the FNAF 3 trailer 
and it portrays instability and provokes fear. William Afton's characterization in the movie was pretty much flawless. Lillard did an exceptional job with the adaptation of the character, and I would bet a lot of money that the sequel is going to do him even more justice. I just hope we see him more next time, and I hope we see more of his cool acts and his true relationship with Vanessa. It's interesting to see the variances between the different forms of media attempting to use the same character, because as we've discussed already, William Afton in the games is pretty different to William Afton in the movie, and that's likely due to the nature of the media in which the character is presented in. It's a lot easier to tell a cohesive and gut-wrenching story using film over a series of games. However, William Afton's character in the original trilogy of novels, The Silver Eyes, The Twisted Ones and The Fourth Closet, is a pretty drastic change. A lot of people tend to talk about the fact that through these three books, Afton has a strangely broad personality evolution. The Silver Eyes starts off with him as Dave Miller, and much like how Steve Raglan was presented, he appears to be twisted and his appearance is zombie-like with dead glassy eyes. And at this point we see him as maniacal and sadistic. It's later on in the fourth closet when his character takes a huge turn unlike anything we've really ever seen from him before. Here he is, seemingly a husk of his old self, yet an experimentalist stupidly close to immortality and strangely theatrical. It's a character development that not everyone in the community was a huge fan of, but at the same time it's a side of William Afton that can't go forgotten. My absolute favourite face of William Afton, however, does not lie in that trilogy of novels, but rather in the Fazbear Frights books of all places. Believe it or not, I believe the scariest form of William Afton is the one in which he appears the most powerless. And while that sounds counterintuitive, let me explain what I mean. The Man in Room 1280 is one of the greatest stories in the entire series, and I'm pretty sure looking back, the community agrees with me on that. The Man in Room 1280 also top tier. It's great. Um... I think a lot of I think everybody agrees, or at least most people agree, that it's it's a really good story. The whole story is carried by the dramatic irony of us knowing it's about William Afton, while all of the characters in universe have absolutely no idea. It makes it pretty easy to read because we know there's something coming around the corner. Like, there was never a chance this story was going to end well. Of course, I'll give a summary of the story and I'll keep it brief. Welcome to Heracles Hospital, an old-fashioned hospital with a fairly new pizzeria-esque interior and cerebrus statues outside the entrance. Greek mythology instantly sets the scene here and tells us that this place is a representation of the gates of hell. There's a random woman in the middle of the story doing a crossword and the letter she fills in for one of the clues literally spells it out for us. H-A-D-E-S. Hades, God of the Underworld. And within this hospital there is a man who is beaten in every way, deformed and scorched body parts. There is no way he could have been alive looking at the state he is in, yet he is. His heart is beating and his brain is active. It turns out there is something keeping him alive. A shadowy young boy with curly black hair haunts the halls of the hospital, protecting the body of the man. Nurses tried to put an end to his life, but every time it backfires. I think it was pretty obvious from this story that its intent was to show us what was truly going on during Ultimate Custom Night, a game that I actually skipped over but feel the need to talk about now. It's Afton's idea of an infinite purgatory. I usually call it his Ultimate Custom Nightmare. This game is brilliant in doing what it aims to achieve, and that's being put in the shoes of William Afton himself and having him face his past. All of his creations, the nightmarish illusions he put in the mind of tortured children, and the best part of it all, facing himself. The soundtrack in Ultimate Custom Night is called Isoptrophobia, the fear of seeing yourself in the mirror. Afton defends against himself, the monster he himself has become and it's a really interesting dynamic to think about in this game. All of it is run by the one you should not have killed. Nothing more in the game than a smiling shadowed face of a child. It's terrifying to finally have the role in the game where you are the killer. 
you're the wrongdoer. You're the villain of the series, the reason for all of these games to happen, and the reason this very video exists. Being put in that position and fighting past trauma all at once is gut-wrenching. And what's going on on the outside? Afton is laying in a hospital bed, being kept alive the entire time. Eventually, after years, a priest is called in to meet the man in room 1280, and he is able to communicate with him to find out what he wants. When they go through with it, Afton manages to get to the Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center, where he subsequently bursts into pure agony and escapes by infecting Fazbear branded items. Commence the Fazbear Fright series. So the reason I really like this story is because Afton seems so powerless at this point. He can't move his body, he's being tortured by one of his own victims, and his body is so frail and old. Yet somehow, when people go into the room he is in, they just don't feel right. Somehow, against all odds, he's being kept alive and nobody can do anything about it. It's all a part of nature doing its thing. Nobody knows who he is, and hence nobody knows how dangerous he really is. And as the story goes, he does manage to escape the hospital and find himself a new body. This time, a body that towers over everything and everyone. What is explicitly called the Agony. A huge mix of infected Fazbear branded items, including Eleanor, that forms the shape of a rabbit creature. It's here where there's this fight which lasts one epilogue, but we do witness what I think is one of the coolest William Afton events the entire series has ever seen. And it's like the entire community just forgot about it. I'll read you this quote, then I'll explain to you why it chills me to the core. Afton? Larson asked. That is you in there, isn't it? Though, I'm not even sure what to call you now. Afton's amalgamation glared back at the detective repositioning his pieces so he stood taller and broader on the end of the dock, the loathsome atrocity that was William Afton announced in such sonorous tones the dock juddered. I am agony. This is so raw, I go back to it every now and again. And although this scene could have gone on a little longer, or Afton could have been the main villain of the Phasma Frights, it makes me so happy because it encapsulates everything we've just been talking about. William realised he isn't himself anymore, he's a monster. As I said at the start of the video, when we saw Springtrap for the first time, we had no idea he was the killer all along. The people within the world don't even know what to call the thing he turned into. But Afton's final line, like genuinely this is the last time we ever properly saw him in the timeline, Afton's last spoken line is I am agony. And that is so bittersweet because he's right. He is the very concept of agony. He's made so many kids and their families suffer in the past. He went insane and made himself suffer for so long and he knows that even after his true demise, he will live on in other forms and his legacy will be the reason his story continues even without his actual soul or conscience present. I am agony is Afton's final line because the next thing that happens in the story is the huge trash rabbit is pushed into the lake alongside the puppet. And as the puppet's mask is slowly submerged under the water, Afton, the agony and everything that comes down with it, drowns in the lake, never to be seen again. A fitting climax to Afton's story, in my opinion, especially considering the implications of the lake going back to the idea of old man consequences and the drowning in the lake ending. I'm not going to go into the whole canonicity debate of this whole thing because either way, this is a great ending to Afton. It's written really well and I think it's the truest form of the character. This is a monster, Hellspawn, now just one with the force of agony. He said he always comes back and in a way, he's not necessarily wrong. But if any death is the most satisfying for me, from a story standpoint, it's this one. 
This has been one of my biggest video projects to date, so thank you so much for sticking around until the very end of the video. This one has actually been in the works for months now, but I've been pretty busy doing other stuff IRL, so I'm sorry it took a while to come out. Here's another reminder that this video was sponsored by G Fuel, so make sure you go over to their website and use the code OZONEYT for 20% off. This is the best way to support me in what I do, and you get a tasty treat out of it. To conclude, Afton's story arc has been absolutely wild and has completely carried most of the content of the FNAF games. There would be no FNAF without a psychopathic killer doing some wild and maniacal stuff, and I hope this video has shown you how much of an impact he has had on not only the games, but also the books and the movie too. Thank you all so, so, so much for watching this video, and I'll hopefully see you in another one.